I openly discussed that with him and admitted it all because it was true. I was telling the truth. You and were telling him the truth about a lie. No. Well, okay, so yes. Yes, you were telling him the that, truth no, I, about a lie. One of the key moments there from my interview this year with Mueller witness Jerome Corsi. We saw Corsi admit that he helped Roger Stone lie to Congress and that he had to clean up those lies to prosecutors. He also said he's ready to die in jail based on refusing that Mueller plea. Now let's bring in former Watergate prosecutor Nick Ackerman and Maya Wiley, who worked in the Southern District of New York and was a counsel to the mayor. Uh, Nick, what do we learn legally from that interview? I think what we learned is that what Mr. Corsi is trying to do is to extricate himself from being involved in the same conspiracy that's been charged against the 13 Russian intelligence officers in July of this past year, uh, the conspiracy of which was to break into the Democratic National Committee, steal documents and emails, and then stage and release those documents. That's very important. You're talking about the stakes of this, and you're saying right. Mueller over here has said these foreigners, Russians, broke the law in the U.S. with their actions. Right. And the question, which we don't know, but you're putting forward a legal theory that would be very bad for some of these folks, is that on the U.S. side, Jerome Corsi could be potentially charged as helping those Russians. That he could be charged as a member of that conspiracy helping those Russians. If you look at what he lied about and how he's tried to dance around all of this, it is extremely clear that what he's trying to do is to keep himself out of that conspiracy and portray himself as somebody who just learned about certain things after the fact uh, and really had nothing to do with Julian Assange. He admits to the email after he lied about it beforehand, but he had no choice but to admit to that email about Ted Malik going to visit Assange. He comes up with this crazy story about suddenly having this epiphany on an airplane trip from the U.S. to Italy, where he suddenly came to him that Assange was going to release emails about Hillary Clinton's campaign manager um, in October about Podesta. Uh, and that tries to say he gave that information, may have given the information to Roger Stone. And that's why Roger Stone, before that, tweeted that it's now uh, Podesta's turn in the barrel. But to be fair, Maya, on a long plane ride, you can get some good thinking done. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you've made a career of disinformation, <laughs> which is exactly who Jerome Corsi is. I mean, this is a person who, remember 2004 in the Swift boat scandal, right? We have John Kerry, who literally was a decorated war hero, and we have a Jerome Corsi creating a, really a fictitious set of disinformation facts to undermine his campaign about him not being a hero. This is the same person who created disinformation about who Barack Obama was in the 2008 campaign. And at the same time, I, it is very, very hard to believe that he came up with that on an, on an airplane when, remember, the question we believe from some of the, from the draft uh, in, in, uh, report from Robert Mueller was that he was asked specifically whether or not he was asked to go try to get those emails, ask someone to get those emails. And he said, oh, yeah, I was asked, but I said no. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't have anything to do with something that might be part of an investigation. I mean, so to Nick's point, that's not forgetting mm. about an email. That's actually crafting what is, sounds very directly like a lie and how would you forget those emails? How would you forget those emails? Particularly existed? when you destroyed them. I mean, that's what he did. When he was called, knew that there was a Senate committee investigating what was going on, he destroyed all those emails. And if you look at the other one of the emails that they found, when he's talking about what's going to happen with Podesta, he starts it off by saying, word is. He didn't say, I got a, you know, a bolt, lightning bolt from God on an airplane. He doesn't say, oh, you're, I just yeah, you're getting to into that the, up. You're getting into the record that we now have, which we didn't before. When he says, word is, that right. tells you that he is drawing information from somewhere else. From somebody. Somebody has told him something. And that's what Mueller's people wanted to know. Because that puts him right into the soup of the staging and releasing of the documents, which puts him into that conspiracy. So let me push you on that. If it was as bad as, as that... Why would Mueller offer him a plea on only false statements, which we know because Jerome Corsi leaked it and told me about it? Because they hope and they thought that he could testify to the, his role in the conspiracy, Stone's role in the conspiracy, and other people's role but in the conspiracy. But if they had better 
if, if the Mueller folks had better evidence, they could indict on that without his testimony. Are they missing some potentially key evidence there if it exists? We don't know. We just don't know. That's possible. But keep in mind, every time that Mueller has gotten a guilty plea, he has not actually gotten out the facts of these conspiracies and people's roles in the Russia um, right, Trump he holds campaign. it back he for strategic holds that back reasons. Purposely, because he doesn't want it to all get out until he's ready to get it out in a final indictment. A lot of this heat, Maya, is circling around Roger Stone. And that is quite clear, even though there's much we may not know. Here was Roger Stone uh, late this year, basically reinforcing his loyalty, as he puts it, to Donald Trump. There's no circumstance under which I would testify against the president because I'd have to bear false witness against him. I'd have to make things up, and I'm not going to do that. For people who aren't steeped in this or don't follow it every day, that could sound reasonable because nobody wants to make things up. What is wrong with the argument he's making? What's wrong, and if you notice, Jerome Corsi makes the same argument. I right? did notice that. It's, so it's interesting that they both have the same argument about cooperating with Robert Mueller. But the point is, he's saying, I would be forced, so a, a, a sitting federal prosecutor would be requiring me, he would be suborning perjury from me or charging me with it, meaning he's asking me to perjure myself, to make something up, to lie, to fabricate evidence, to get his outcome. But if, if, if Robert Mueller is having a conversation with getting an agreement with him, it's because he has evidence. Mm -hmm. It's not because he doesn't, right? A prosecutor's not going and saying, I have absolutely no evidence that you've done anything wrong, but I'd like to enter into a plea agreement with you. That doesn't happen. So it's really what he's saying is there's evidence. I'm trying to play this a different angle. And I think you got closer to the truth as Jerome Corsi, who himself raised the pardon, you know the part the word pardon and I and I think between the two of them they may that may be exactly the angle that they're going for but I think to Nick's point their real concern should be being pulled into a, a conspiracy charge. This is the well, same thing that happened with Manafort. I mean Manafort purported to cooperate and tell all but Mueller knew what he knew. He knew exactly what Manafort could testify to. He held it back, and Manafort just went in there and baldly lied. I mean, he just didn't tell the truth. And let's just remember one real thing that we know about how Robert Mueller, because every prosecutor operates this way, is when Jerome Corsi or Michael Cohen walked into their interviews, right, and they got asked a direct question about what they knew, and they lied, they then pulled their evidence out that they already had. In other words, they're testing whether or not they're going to be truthful. And when they're not, they can demonstrate to them that they haven't been truthful. And that's why, that is why Roger Stone's claim just seems right. so unrealistic. Well, and Maya, you just put, you put your finger on something that uh, I think a lot of people are learning as they track the legal process here, which is that the casual way most human beings ask and answer questions in good faith, how was your day? What did you have for lunch? Is an exchange of information. That's not how prosecutors use questions, and, and people learn that lesson at their own peril. Uh, there's another big interview I want to ask you about, and it's one that I, I, I happen to know I think some people ask you about over the course of this year because you were a part of it, uh, which was a Mueller witness that I spoke to, a, a key one in the probe who made a lot of news. It was former Trump aide Sam Nunberg. We talked to him on a pretty wild day when he initially announced to the world that he would refuse to comply with the Mueller subpoena as legally required. He did have a change of heart, which came about in partly in conversation with Maya Wiley in a newsmaking moment of 2018. Do you understand that you have a legal obligation to comply? Yeah, I have a legal. Technically, I have a legal obligation. Does your lawyer think what you're doing now tonight is a good idea? I have no idea. I think he may have dropped me, frankly. I don't know. I definitely know my father doesn't like it, and my father's my, one of my co-counsels. I think your family wants you home for Thanksgiving, and I hope you will testify. I th here, here's and the thing, know, though. Isn't this before, ridiculous? No, it's not ridiculous, Sam. It, it's it's it November. so not ridiculous. November. What do you think of reflecting on that now? Well, first of all, I think that was a team effort. You and I didn't prepare that, but I think it was your graciousness uh, that actually set up the tone of that evening. And secondly, I'm just thankful he did. I'm thankful he cooperated and testified. He's in a lot less trouble today because he did that. And I think what we've seen from others who've been asked to appear before the grand jury who don't do it and don't come clean, 
makes a lot more sense to just come forward and participate in our process. Mm. I, I appreciate what you're saying there. I also think it's something that each of us have observed, which is you have a, a justice system and you look for accountability and truth uh, and you can judge, that's the process, people who make mistakes. And yet whether you're covering mistakes by people in this Trump orbit or mistakes by people in inner city Chicago who are, who are being railroaded as they some, as are sometimes the complaint, you can make a mistake and still be a human being. And I, I thought you, if I will return it, uh, addressed him not only as a person who was making, in the middle of, you were talking to him while he was making a mistake, while he was planning to effectively break the law, uh, but also looked at him as a human being who might uh, try to undo the mistake, and, and he did, and he was, as we are on a holiday episode, I have to say it, he was home for the holidays. Uh, my thanks to you, my Wiley and Nick Ackerman. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.